All right, welcome back, everyone. So we're going to continue on with our Roman Empire now. So just to make sure everybody's got the chronology straight and what you should have done, we already discussed the Roman Empire starting with Augustus, right? He was the first dynasty, the Julio-Claudian dynasty. The last member of that Julio-Claudian dynasty was Nero, and you should have watched the documentary on him before you're watching this, right? So if you haven't seen that Nero documentary, watch that first. And then after Nero, we're about to enter what we call the Golden Age of Rome between 96 and 180 AD. Um, you know, I always make sure this is clear that, again, it's the Golden Age. It's not a Golden Age for everybody, right? Again, if you saw the Nero video, it wasn't a Golden Age for Christians. or It's not going to be a Golden Age for the Jewish people, as we're going to see in today's lecture. Uh, so that's important just to keep in mind. But from a Roman perspective, this is a very powerful time. It's the second part of the Pax Romana. It's when things are going really well. They have a stable set of rulers. Um, so there's a lot of things that make Rome really strong in these years, primarily between 96 and 180 AD. Uh, right before the Golden Age, we do have another set of rulers. I'm not going to require you to know them. I'm just going to put them up here for you. These are known as the Flavians. They rule from 69 to 96 AD. So Nero's dead at 69. From 69 to 96 AD, we have three other rulers, Vespasian, Titus, Domitian. You don't need to know them. I'm not going to test you on them. Vespasian was the one who built the Colosseum. There's important, they are important emperors, obviously, but I just kind of, you know, only so many emperors I, I can expect everybody to learn about. And so those three, if you don't know them, not the end of the world, right? But if you want to jot them down, you can. What happens after the Flavians from 96 to 180 AD is the focus of this lecture. So here are the what we call five adopted emperors. You are going to need to know all five of them. And they this is kind of the basic thing we're going to cover in this lecture. It's the most important stuff. And these are, you can see the dates, the adopted emperors during what we call the Golden Age. Why we call them the adopted emperors, I'm going to explain in a moment. So get all their names down. Um, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus, Pius, Marcus Aurelius. Uh, under Trajan, I put a couple other key words you want to know, and Hadrian, I'm going to kind of in another slide give you a couple more terms for him. Um, and so basically, you're going to need to know five. You don't need to memorize the dates, but you want to know what each one did and why they were important for what is the golden age of the Roman Empire. So we'll start with Nerva, and let me just kind of go to our map here, and we'll start talking about Nerva and Trajan, and then go from there. So Nerva, he was the only emperor for two years, 96 to 98 AD. However, he is important because what he does do, Nerva, is he kind of restores a sense of decorum back to Rome. He, he's kind of the anti-Caligula. He's down to earth. He treats the senators with respect. And that helps, you know, create a more stable Rome as opposed to, you know, having some crazy guy like Caligula in charge. So that, that helps. Um, then you also have the other key point about Nerva, which is, he dies without a son. He doesn't have a son. And so before he died, he adopted Trajan. And with these five emperors, what we're going to see is each of them is going to adopt the other, right? And so the two most important are going to be Trajan and Hadrian. Those are the two we're going to spend the most time on. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, I don't know if you've heard of him before again, but he was in that movie Gladiator. Uh, but anyways, so the movie got everything by the way. <laughs> so anyway, so here you have Nerva. He doesn't have a son. He adopts Trajan to be his own son. And by being able to adopt who you want, you basically can handpick someone you know is qualified. If you have a son and the son is an idiot and he's going to be the next emperor, then you're stuck with an idiot as an emperor. But if you can pick your own person, then, you know, that's really good. So anyway, so let's move on to Ner uh, Trajan because he's ruling for about 20 years. And Trajan has, I guess, three big things I want you to know about him. Uh, first of all, he's actually from Spain, right? He's not from Italy. Most of these Roman emperors were from Italy, but Trajan is from Spain. And as I said, there's three major things I guess I want you to know about Trajan, right? So again, for quiz questions, what are three things about Trajan? Number one is he takes land. What land does he conquer? Well, he conquers land north of these two rivers. Those were those words, the Rhine and the Danube. And who is living north of the Rhine and the Danube in these kind of purple areas up here? Well, the group of people you should be reading about right now in the Germania, right? So these are the Germanic tribes. He's conquering that area all north of the Rhine and the Danube. He's doing it very effectively. And, you know, this is something that brings them a lot of wealth, a lot of money into the Roman 
empire. So that's one thing about Trajan. He's very good at conquests. What does he do with that money? Well, this is point number two. Takes a lot of this money, and there's so much money, he creates something called the Alimenta. I put that as a keyword there as well for you, which is public assistance for the poor. So basically, there's so much money that Trajan can say, hey, you're poor, here's some extra money from, from the Roman treasury. Uh, not very common in ancient, in ancient times. And it just shows you the wealth and uh, strength of Rome during what we call the kind of golden age of Rome. Uh, so there's that. And then the third thing about Trajan, is he builds a lot of infrastructure, kind of like Claudius. If you remember Claudius built the aqueducts and a bunch of that kind of stuff. So did Trajan build roads and aqueducts and canals and bridges. And so he spends a lot of money building up Rome. So again, like his father, he's very down to earth, very different than like a Caligula or even a Claudius type figure. Um, and he's very effective. And therefore the Roman Empire is doing really well under the rulership of first Nerva and now Trajan. Trajan is also going to die of natural causes. That's the other important point, I think. All of these guys, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus, Pius, Marcus, they really, all die of natural causes. Why is that important? Well, it means no one's killing them, right? There isn't any these assassinations and all of that. that. That's kind of one of the key points in that for this, this golden age period. All right, so a couple of pictures of Trajan here. This is just an image of Trajan, and Trajan is very popular in honor of his military conquest. He gets a big column built called Trajan's Column, right? And if you look at the column carefully, it's a big, tall column, but there's like engravings all the way around the column. What's the deal with that? Well, all of that kind of tells the story of his military conquest. So it's actually a bit of a primary source document as well. So that's Trajan, okay? So Trajan dies. Before Trajan dies, he will adopt Hadrian. And so Hadrian, we're going to spend a little bit of time on him as well, because Hadrian's going to be important for two things, one in the western part of Rome and one in the eastern part of Rome. So here we go. And these are some key words right off for Hadrian. And so we'll talk about the most important thing in the western part of Rome, what we call Hadrian's Wall. And then we'll talk about how he's involved with something very important in the eastern part of Rome. And I'll bring up another map to show you this better in the land of Judea. If you remember, we hadn't talked about that piece of real estate for a while. Uh, we're going to come back and mention it again. Judea, of course, that land where uh, the Jewish people, you know, thrived in their early history. So let's talk about the West first. And that's why on this part, I'm just kind of the close-up map of the West here. And it's right up here in Britain. I don't know if any of you have heard of Hadrian's Wall before, but here it is. It's this wall in, in kind of northern Britain, southern Scotland today. I've actually been there. It's really cool. Um, and Hadrian's Wall was quite a big uh, achieve of engineering. Um, and why is Hadrian's Wall important? Well, so let me give you some details and I'll tell you why it's important. It's an 80 mile long wall. I'm also going to show you a couple of pictures here. Um, not the wall if you go there today is obviously not going to look like I described to you, but parts of it are still intact. But it was 80 miles long, about 10 to 15 feet high. Uh, and, of course, you had Roman soldiers patrolling it 24-7. Roman soldiers would live right by Hadrian's Wall. And it was very effective in protecting Roman-controlled Britain. So if you remember which Roman emperor co uh, conquered Britain, remember Claudius, he conquered Britain. But because it's an island, if you have people coming in trying to invade, you got a problem. How long? You, you can't just march. You got to get men on boat. You got to sail the sea, the English Channel. And so having that wall there really was effective in protecting the, the Roman control of Britain for a very long time. So get these other terms down, but I'm going to go on to the next images to show you images of Hadrian's Wall. So this is an image of Hadrian's Wall, right? And you can see, you know, today it's not 10 feet tall, uh, but I want you to notice it's in the middle of nowhere. This is a picture I took, and then I'm going to show you another picture I just grabbed off the Internet because... I didn't take a good image of this, and I really want to show you another component of Hadrian's Wall. This is another image of Hadrian's Wall, right? And where you see here, that's barracks, right? These are where the soldiers would live. And they were, they were pretty large, right? A barrack like this, is, it would hold a lot of men. Um, and there were these barracks every you know, several miles, you'd have these barracks. And the other thing I want you to see is how Hadrian's Wall is built right along these hills and cliffs. So, you know, if somebody's trying to invade Rome from northern Britain, 
you could see them coming forever. Then they got to come up these big hills. Then there's a 15 foot wall here. And then there are Roman soldiers. You're going to think twice before even bothering to try. And so this was very effective in protecting Britain. So, you know, that was one of the accomplishments of Hadrian, Hadrian's Wall. All right, so all that's in the West. Meanwhile, Hadrian is also involved in something very important in the Eastern part of Rome. So we'll continue on our discussion with Hadrian with our next map. All right, so over here, we have this land of Judea, right? We talked about that land early in the semester. And we had talked about how the Jewish people had lived in that land. And we talked about how, if you remember, the Persians came in, first the Babylonians came in, they destroyed the temple, and then the, the Greek, the, the Jew, then the Persians came in, and Cyrus the Great said, go ahead, rebuild Solomon's temple, practice your religion. And I said the Jewish people would live there, but would be under control of other civilizations. And depending on who the civilizations were, sometimes the Jewish people struggled there, sometimes they did a little better, it just depends who was in charge. Well, when we get to about the year 100 AD, the Romans have now moved into Judea. This is before Hadrian. And immediately, the Romans had a really big problem with the Jewish population. And this is going to be important for this lecture and our next lecture as well when we talk about the rise of Christianity. The thing is with Judaism and Christianity, they share one thing, they share a lot of things in common, but one really important thing in common they share is they're both monotheistic religions. And they believe in God, creator, right? One God, and they're monotheistic. Now, this is a problem for the Romans. Why is this a problem for the Romans? Not because the Romans were just polytheistic. It goes beyond that. It is that the Romans had an empire and an emperor. And by definition, if you're a Jewish person, or if you're a Christian person, your top authority, your top value system in life does not come from an emperor or king or a government. It comes from God and that one God. And so if you're a Roman emperor, you want to be the top guy. In fact, the Roman emperors were deified. Remember, the Roman emperors became gods. Um, and so to the Romans, anyone who was Jewish or Christian, simply by being Jewish or Christian, was committing, tre committing treason against Rome. So this creates conflict. And so as the Romans move into Judea, there's already conflicts. They destroy the second temple Solomon had built there, or Solomon's second temple, not built by Solomon, of course. Um, and that was what was left was the Wailing Wall. And it gets to the point when we get to the time of Hadrian, where it's not a surprise, the Jewish people are feeling really on edge. And in my Middle East class, I actually spend a lot more time on this. In this class, I do this real briefly because it's a Western civilization class. Uh, but if anybody is really interested, every spring semester, I teach a history of the Middle East course, and that's a lot of fun, really engaging and, and important material. Uh, but for us, you know, what does happen is a very important story under Hadrian's reign. Because Hadrian really hammers down at the Jewish people in Judea. And one of the things Hadrian does right off is he outlaws circumcision. So there are a few things here. Make sure you get all this down. Number one, he outlaws circumcision. Now, I'm assuming you know what circumcision is, right? When uh, the male baby is circumcised. And for most people, you know, a lot of boys get circumcised today because doctors say it's healthier, cleaner, or whatever, right? For Jewish people, circumcision is not just about health and cleanliness. For Jewish people, circumcision is the core of being Jewish. It is like one of the, the very first things um, in Jewish culture is like, top, top thing. Boys are circumcised, right? It's part of the Jewish identity. And Hadrian says, no more circumcisions. So if you're Jewish, you're going to be pretty upset. So upset that there was a man named Simon Bar Kusiba, I put him there in one of those key words there, who in Judea leads a rebellion. He, leads a, he says, we're tired of the Romans here. The Romans are treating us poorly. Now Hadrian has outlawed circumcision. This means rebellion. And so he leads a rebellion. What does Hadrian do? Hadrian enters Judea with a massive army and massacres countless numbers. I've seen accounts from Roman sources that say half a million, 500,000 Jewish inhabitants in Judea were murdered. Then he's not done because as he's killing the Jewish population there, he's outlawed circumcision, he destroys some other temples, he does one other thing. He takes this land of Judea and he renames it. And he says, from now on, it's no longer going to be called Judea. From now on, it's going to be called Palestine. If you've heard that phrase or that term used to describe this land, people wonder where that term come from. 
It's actually when the Romans took this land over, they renamed the land Judea to Palestine. And why did Hadrian do this? Well, think about what he's doing. He's outlawing circumcision. He's renaming the land. He's killing the population. He's destroying the temples, the synagogues. Guys, this is about destroying the Jewish identity, destroying the Jewish people. Uh, th this is a genocide, right? I mean, when you think of the Jewish people in genocide, we think World War II, and unfortunately, that was not the first time something like that had happened. There were other attempts in history to wipe out the Jewish people, and this is something Hadrian attempted to do. And when this happened, the Jewish people, the ones that there were very few that remained there, many more were exiled, they had to flee, um, and it's going to be very hard for the Jewish people to reestablish control of their homeland as a result of this. This is why, if you remember in the previous lecture when we talked about earlier in the semester, I said it will be until 1948, until the Jewish people really have uh, an official control of this land again. Um, and so th that's pretty long term. You know, we talk about this stuff and I say this stuff impacts people all the way till today. This is this is a major event that really has implications in the Middle East and on the globe for for centuries, and so that's the other big thing Hadrian does. So you know, safe to say Hadrian not too popular among the Jewish community even to this day. None of the Roman emperors really are. Um, and again, we're going to see similar issues with the Christians, right? Uh, if you saw the Nero video, we you saw how Christians were persecuted, and we're going to do more lecturing on that next time. All right, so anyways, that's Hadrian. Definitely want to know all about that, Hadrian's Wall, and what happened in Judea. All right, let's move on. And what I so here's what I want to show you. So this is still part of the Golden Age. Hadrian is gone. Uh, but this is also part of the Golden Age, and this isn't specifically to Hadrian. It's just kind of one of the things Rome is known for, the Roman baths. Uh, so you have that. That's part of the Golden Age as well. And then I just want to briefly mention these other last two emperors of the Golden Age, and I just have one more slide to show you. So you have Antoninus Pius. You don't really need to worry about him other than knowing he's one of the emperors during the Golden Age. If you were to open up a Roman history book on Antoninus Pius, you'd barely find any information because he did so little. So he's not too important. But things are stable. He rules. He dies of natural causes, and he adopted Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius becomes an emperor, and he's going to rule from 161 to about 180 AD, and he dies of natural causes. Now, the only real thing you need to know about Marcus Aurelius is he actually went and had a son. And who is his son? Well, again, if you ever watched that movie Gladiator, his son is named Commodus. I'll put his name up in our, in our next lecture when we talk about him and what happens, because when Marcus Aurelius dies, that's the end of the Golden Age. Which also means if that's the end of the Golden Age, right, if the Roman Empire has been going rising, 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 and then here we have the Golden Age, what happens after the Golden Age? You're going to get your decline. And so you're going to begin the fall after Marcus Aurelius because he will have a son, and Commodus' his son is, well, not a very good ruler. And now, and if you ever go see the movie Gladiator, if you haven't seen it, just, you know, spoiler alert, the way the movie goes is not what really happened. Uh, no, Marcus Aurelius was not going to change Rome into a republic, and no, Marcus Aurelius uh, was not going to, you know, name some other general as his heir, and, you know, Commodus was not, you know, um, you know, going to kill his father and all that. It's a lot of stuff that was a bit off. Uh, but anyways, um, what is important is that this is kind of the peak of the Roman Empire. So, again, Nerva, you want to know a little bit. Trajan and Hadrian, you want to know a lot more about them. Antoninus Pius, not so much, and then Marcus Aurelius, the most important thing about him is he had a son. So these are the Roman baths. It's actually some of the best Roman baths are actually in England in a city called Bath. Um, and then one other image I just want to show you, which is something else the Romans did for fun during the um, during the Golden Age, and that's the gladiators, right? And this is, you know, if you again see the movie Gladiator, you can see how their their clothing and this mosaic and stuff very different. Uh, but these were brutal competitions. This guy over here, man, I would be messing with him. That's a big old dude. Um, but uh, th th they're fighting here, and I just always want to always bring this up in, in class, which is what are the gladiator games? And they're really just people killing each other for sport. Um, and you know, it's entertainment. And for the Romans, this was all fine. And, you know, try to imagine that in our society today. I mean, how would that go over in our society today? And I sometimes ask my students in class, hey, if the gladiator games were legal today, would people go and watch? And all of a sudden go, yeah, people would go. And, you know, 
if that's true, that really again shows you this point of human nature, that human nature doesn't change. Why don't we have gladiator games today? Because values, right? Our values say, no, it's not okay to watch human beings kill one another. Uh, but there is this, you know, I don't know what it is, but there are a lot of people who are wired to go see stuff like this, and it was probably part of the Roman Empire. Tells you something about Roman culture and Roman time period and Roman values. So, anyways, the gladiator games. All right, so this I want to show you that mosaic as well. So that's it on the adopted emperors, this kind of golden age of Rome, right? And then from there, we're going to move on and talk about the fall of the, or not the fall of the Roman Empire, but what happens after. There's this kind of crisis period, then there's a recovery period, and then there's a fall. Now, the, this Roman Empire is a bit of a roller coaster ride, and it's not just a straight shot up and a straight shot down. So we're going to kind of see what happens after, you know, Mark Aurelius dies in our next lecture. All right, hope all that was clear. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.